did he maybe have this uncontrollable sexual urge that just took over his entire body? Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpott. This is Sandy. Well, this is Sandy's butt. And today I've got an unsolved missing person case from Australia. And I just want to thank Paul for requesting this case. Thank you, Paul. I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again, but missing person cases just blow my mind because people don't just disappear. But there's also no proof that the person has been harmed. And it's not even unheard of for people who have been missing for years and years to just show up one day totally fine. So that for me kind of keeps hope alive in a way. This is the case of Megan Mulqueeny. Megan Louise Mulqueeny was a 17 year old girl living in Canberra in Australia at the time of her disappearance in 1984. She had what was described as a warm smile and hazel eyes. And she had brown hair that sort of framed her face in a typical 80s hairstyle kind of way. And when she went missing, she was wearing a black corduroy jacket and skirt, a pink and gray checked blouse and black leather flat shoes, as well as purple stockings. Her parents were Dorothy Tallis and Paul Mulqueeny, and Megan was the eldest of three children. And according to her family, Megan was gentle, kind, warm, loving, and a little bit shy. And one of her main hobbies was actually ice skating. And she was also described as pretty smart and she was considered a gifted student. And she studied in Narrabunda College at the time of her disappearance. And she was always very reliable. She would always be where she said she was gonna be. She would always do what she said she was gonna do. And Megan never did anything to upset anyone. She just had such a kind, warm heart. So that made it even more difficult for her family to process when she just disappeared one day. At the time of her disappearance, she had been working a part-time job in Big W, and this is one of those shops that has a bit of everything. You know, they had men's clothes, women's clothes, kids' clothes, they had toys, a beauty part, they had books, home appliances, garden tools, you get the gist. But let's get into the details of Megan's disappearance. On the morning of Saturday the 28th of July, Megan seemed happy and normal, it didn't seem like anything was wrong and this was according to her mother, Dorothy. So to start off her day, she got the bus to Woden Plaza and this was a shopping centre in Canberra. This is where she was due to start her shift in Big W at about 8.30 a.m. She arrived at work, no bother, she did her short shift and then just after 12, she left the premises. The last known sighting of Megan was at about 12.15 when she was spotted just outside the western entrance of the shopping centre, basically in the western car park. And this is where a person she knew saw her apparently waiting for someone. Now, unfortunately, Megan disappeared at a time where there was no CCTV in the area mobile phones weren't a thing and DNA wasn't really a thing either. And obviously a lot of us complain about technology and social media and all this stuff, but when it comes to missing person cases, it can just be so helpful. And when you look back at older cases and they don't even have a mobile phone or little things like that, can totally crack a case wide open. But anyway, she was supposed to catch a bus to Mawson, which is the suburb that she lived in, in Canberra. And this would have been about a 10 minute journey once she'd gotten on the bus. But that never happened. And I mean, Megan disappeared in an area that was almost completely surrounded by nature reserves and just woodlands. And that to me is very concerning. And interestingly enough, when Megan hadn't arrived home by 1 p.m., Dorothy, instantly went into panic mode. And this might seem dramatic to some people, like she was only due to leave at about 12, 15 or so. So why was she already panicking at 1 p.m.? But she did say that Megan was such a reliable person and it would have been out of character for her to be any kind of late. And if she was gonna be late, like potentially had to stay back in work or anything like that, she would have let her parents know beforehand. So almost immediately, Dorothy called a few of Megan's friends, but nobody had seen or heard from her. So Dorothy and Paul just grew more and more concerned as the minutes turned into hours. And then things only got worse as the hours turned into days. And I mean, look where we're at now. And it's often said that close family members have this keen intuition of when a loved one has gone missing that they either have a feeling that they're still here and that they're okay, or they have a feeling that they're not. 
And on this note, that Saturday night, the day Megan disappeared, Paul, her father, just all he could think about was the fact that she was gone or that something really terrible had happened to her and that she was in a horrible place. For those of you that are a bit more spiritual and stuff, you might see something in that. For the rest of you, it might just be a, oh well, maybe it was just, you don't really know, but then do you know on some level? I don't know. So obviously Megan was reported missing and the police launched their investigation. The thing is, Woden Plaza is nice and built up and renovated and it's beautiful now. It's a Westfield. But in 1984, it was a little bit more of a rough area and there would have been kind of undesirables around. So that is a little concerning as well. And with this in mind, at the time, they did carry out many thorough searches in the surrounding areas. Like they searched miles and miles of wooded area. And they also had divers search Lake Burley Griffin, which is a very large body of water in the middle of Canberra. And they also had them search Lake Ginindera, Ginindera which is 15 kilometers north of the shopping center. But despite all these searches, nothing was found. So police obviously continued to investigate and search for months after Megan's disappearance. They knocked on doors and they essentially did everything they possibly could to find some answers, generate some kind of leads, but ultimately nothing really came of it. And one major police theory in this case was with regards to this person that Megan was allegedly waiting for, the last person that saw her said, she looked like she was waiting for someone. So what's that about? Megan apparently had an admirer. He was an older boy at Narrabunda College and this guy had developed quite an intense crush on Megan. And he was 18 years old and also a year 12 student. Now he was 18, she was 17. Not a massive age gap, but in school, these things seem larger. Like if you're 17, you're with an 18 year old, it seems like a big deal. <laughs> and it's not a massive deal, but he was older, it's just something to note. So this guy's name was Philip T. And he had asked Megan to go out with him on a number of occasions for a whole year. She said no several times. And according to evidence presented at an inquest, she was due to meet Philip that day for lunch. And this just so happened to be on the 28th of July, the Saturday she went missing at the exact same time. This is either very suspicious or very unlucky for him in the timing of everything. That whole scenario is pretty telling. It tells us a lot about Philip's character and the fact that he consistently, kept, he kept asking her to go out with him and he would not take no for an answer until he finally wore her down and she said, fine, I'll go to lunch with you. The exact time they were finally gonna meet up after he had shown probably a little too much interest in this girl, she went missing and she has never been seen again. That does not sit well with me at all. Okay, so obviously Philip was questioned several times and he was thoroughly looked into and he agreed that yes, he was supposed to meet her for lunch that day. But according to him, what happened was he arrived there, she wasn't there, so he just went home. And obviously they spoke to him on more than one occasion, but according to the police, his account was fairly consistent. And it had also been corroborated by several people that he had associated with that day but it didn't take long for police to dismiss him as a suspect. So I guess we're just taking his word for it. Obviously there are certain details that they have that we don't have. So they probably have good reason to dismiss him, but from the outside looking in, it's almost wild. However, in 2004, some new information emerged from an unexpected source. It was actually an Irish woman called Neve Large that contacted the Irish police about a Buddhist teacher named Prince Ratu, who was based in Melbourne. And according to Prince Ratu, there was a man with huge karma to pay because he had murdered someone when he was younger. Apparently this man had hit his victim over the head with a baseball bat and disposed of her remains in a dumpster. And the alleged killer of this story was named Philip T. But 
as soon as I heard this, I was like, but how could this random Buddhist teacher get this information? Like, where is this coming from? And obviously when this came out, Philip was definitely interviewed again, and he still denied murdering Megan. But he did admit that he had counseling sessions with Prince Ratu. So it's not even like this person was a total stranger. Philip was like, oh yeah, I know him. And in these counseling sessions that he had had with him, Philip had opened up about his guilt regarding Megan. <laughs> but before we get carried away, it was the guilt that he felt about failing to meet her. Like if he was there before her, nothing bad would have happened to her as opposed to the guilt of actually harming her himself. If you take that as the truth, that does make sense as well. Megan was alone because he wasn't there yet. So I get that, I do. But it's still a bit like, hmm. But unfortunately, Prince Ratu died before he could be officially interviewed. So I guess we just have to take Philip's word for it. I'm not sure how I feel about that. But even still, authorities and the media don't really believe that Philip had anything to do with it. However, there was still someone that was very much on their radar. And this man's name was Paul Vincent Phillips. And obviously I've just explained about Philip T right up until 2004, but I am gonna go back in time just so you can get the full timeline about Paul Vincent Phillips. So back to 1984 when Megan first went missing. Paul was this insanely creepy 24 year old guy who was living in Canberra at the time of Megan's disappearance. So he was tall, he had these dark piercing eyes, and when you search him online, the main picture that comes up is this picture of him where he puts the middle finger up to the camera. What a lovely, lovely man. <laughs> he also didn't have the best childhood either. Like he grew up around abuse and neglect, and all of these things are serious risk factors for a whole hoax of issues in adulthood. And I'm sure you're thinking, okay, but that's hardly a ground to suspect someone of foul play in Megan's disappearance. Like, how are we getting from A to B here? But two months after Megan's disappearance, something horrendous and slightly eerie happened. In the very same car park that Megan disappeared from, another 17 year old girl was in her car and Paul Vincent Phillips broke into her car and drove her away. He drove her to the Uriara Pine Forest and he, he raped her at knife point. Luckily though, he was arrested the following day and he went on to be sentenced to seven years in prison, having pled guilty to abduction, robbery, assault, and rape. Side note, seven years doesn't really feel like enough to me for something that aggressive. Speaking of which, this unfortunately was not the end of his crimes because Paul Vincent Phillips went on to be a serial violent sex offender. He had also been linked to a series of horrific unsolved sex crimes in Canberra in the 1980s. Just not enough evidence to actually convict him of these things. But the 17 year old girl that he attacked that time, two months after Megan's disappearance, was only one of many victims that he definitely had. And all these girls fit a very similar description. They were all petite, approximately five foot four inches, appeared young with childlike features, had shoulder length hair, usually dark brown, which was worn loose, were alone at the time of the attacks, and he abducted several of these victims from car parks, open car parks. So this physical description of Paul's victims matched Megan's description. Another thing about Paul is he had a bit of a nomadic lifestyle. In fact, he lived in 17 places in the Australian Capital Territory alone, not including living in other places in Australia and Tasmania. Like, so not that this makes him a murderer or anything, but this kind of lifestyle would have made it easier for him to get away with something like this. You know, like he would move around a lot. He wouldn't have to explain his whereabouts to people all the time. But during an inquest where they looked into Paul's psychological state at the time of his known attacks, it turned out that at each of these moments in time, he was either in a really bad place personally or something bad had happened in his life, something along those lines. Not that that is any excuse to carry out several sexual assaults on young women, obviously, but it just showed that there was a pattern. 
And what's really interesting about this is that on the Friday, the day before Megan went missing, Paul lost his job. He had been working at an auto records and they just full on sacked him. Ugh. Very suspicious. Also at the time of Megan's disappearance, Paul's then partner was on holidays with her mother in Queensland. And before leaving for this holiday, Paul had offered to mind her car for her. So as far as I'm aware, they didn't live together and she did decline this offer. But when she returned from the holiday, she couldn't quite say if her car had been moved or not. I mean, it may not have been, but this does mean that Paul Vincent Phillips had a means of transportation, which could have enabled him to abduct Megan and if he killed her, could have enabled him to dump her remains somewhere. Yes, that is speculative, but it is just another little, little bit, a little tidbit. But also when Paul's partner returned from that holiday that weekend, she reported that Paul had been very upset, really depressed and distraught, and that he had cried into that Sunday evening. And obviously his reasoning for this was the fact that he had just lost his job on the Friday, but, that could have been a catalyst to make him carry out this awful crime. And maybe that is what he was really upset about. Did he maybe have this uncontrollable sexual urge that just took over his entire body and made him carry out this heinous act against Megan? Obviously that's just speculation, but there is a question mark over it, let's be honest. When he was asked about his movements on the day that Megan disappeared, <sighs> Paul says that he does not recall what he did. He states that he most likely spent the day with a man called Thomas Nash. And when Thomas Nash was interviewed, he also couldn't remember what he did that day and couldn't recall any events. I would just love to know when they were interviewed though. That's the only thing. Like if they were interviewed a day after Megan disappeared, that would be incredibly suspicious. But if it was three or four weeks later, then yeah, I can totally understand why they wouldn't remember what happened on a random Saturday afternoon. You know, like giving the benefit of the doubt if they didn't do anything. Now in 2007, police received an anonymous tip that Paul had dumped Megan's remains near a wood reserve in Tarwa, just outside of Canberra. So this sounds maybe promising, right? Well, they obviously carried out their police searches and guess what they found? Nothing. And throughout the years, Megan's parents were approached multiple times by psychics and mediums, and these people claimed to be able to give them answers and all this stuff. But in reality, this just cost Dorothy and Paul a crap ton of money, and they were just preying on the desperation of Megan's parents. Oh, like that honestly upsets me so much that people would do that. Like I get having a business it's hard sometimes and maybe you genuinely think you can help these people but i don't know that just kind of really pisses me off but fast forward to 2009 and there was another inquest and in this inquest coroner peter dingwall said that it was most likely that megan had been murdered however there still wasn't enough evidence to know this for sure to know who may have done it or to know how they may have done it. But what I will say is their circumstantial evidence against Paul Vincent Phillips was very strong. And I'm sure they have more information than I am actually able to provide simply because there are still some bits of information that are not available to the public. And we'll get to why, <laughs> trust me, it's good. But at this point, Paul Vincent Phillips was named the prime suspect in the case, but there just wasn't enough to actually charge him with anything. And when he was called to give evidence during this inquest, he denied any involvement in Megan's disappearance. And during this conversation, when he was asked what it would take for him to admit that he had done it, his response was, it would take for me to have done it. I swear that on my children, I have children of my own. <sighs> Some people might accept that, but for me, you really want to play that card? How can you sit there and say that and say that, oh, well, I get it, I have children of my own, when we know for a fact that you have been going around abducting and sexually assaulting young girls? Sorry, no. No, like, what a fucking cop out. <sighs> so, obviously, at this point, the general assumption was that Megan was dead and 
had been murdered. So for her family, this was the most difficult part because they kind of had closure, but they didn't because everything was still an unknown. They didn't know whatever happened. They didn't know who was involved. They didn't know how it happened. There was just still a massive question mark and they were still no closer to any answers. So how can you just be okay with the fact that, oh yeah, well, she was probably murdered. But we don't know who by and we don't know how and we don't know when and we don't know where she is and we don't know, uh, like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a person like that, to lose a loved one and have a loved one go missing. But the frustrating part now is that all the teenagers that Megan was growing up with are all in their 50s now. And the scene of her last sighting has now been renovated, so it's totally different. And one witness that was named in an inquest into Megan's probable murder has also died. But then, in April of 2018, only two years ago, there was a break in the case. This is when Paul Vincent Phillips died. And I know you're probably like, how was that break in the case? But just you wait. What I will say is that whether or not he was involved in Megan's disappearance, he did spend most of his adult life in prison. So even if he did it, which we don't know for sure, but even if he did, it's not like he was just out enjoying his life as a free man, you know? But very interestingly, when he died, a lot of new leads came in and these weren't just from one person but several people and they all had something to do with the day Megan went missing. This information is not available to the public because they are still building a case, which is good, but it was strong enough to lead police to believe that A, Paul Vincent Phillips was more than likely involved and that B, he didn't act alone, <sighs> which is... Mm. So at this point, they believe there to be people out there that have answers or have some bits of information that are going to make this case fall into place. So they are urging those people to come forward. I mean, it has been 36 years now. So they think that the passage of time and the fact that Paul Vincent Phillips has passed away, that there isn't gonna be a threat to anybody. You know, like if Paul Vincent Phillips had posed some kind of threat that that might have stopped a person from coming forward, but he's gone now, so. And police are still working on this case and they just know that it could take something so small for things to finally come together. Sadly, Megan's grandparents passed away years ago without having any answers on what happened to their granddaughter. And Megan's parents are now in their 70s, so it is their one need, that one thing that they just need to happen. They need answers. That it would be such an injustice for them to die before they find out what happened to their firstborn daughter. They need to gain closure and they need to be able to put Megan to rest properly. I would be pretty hopeful that the answers are going to come out. Like it, it kind of seems like they might. Okay, now there is just one thing in the general timeline of the day Megan disappeared that I have, I'm, I'm confused about and I just want to bring it up. So what doesn't quite make sense to me is the fact that Dorothy was so panicked by 1 p.m. the day Megan didn't come home. When the actual plan, when we did a bit of digging, was Megan was gonna be meeting up with Philip T for lunch. So it might have been a thing where she didn't tell her parents she was meeting up with a boy. That might have been the situation, but that also would have been out of character because she was apparently so reliable and she would always be where she said she was gonna be and do she what she said she was gonna do. Is it just a coincidence that Dorothy would have been put into panic mode anyway by 1 p.m. because the actual plan was that Megan was gonna meet up with Philip T? So if Dorothy was gonna be panicked anyway, isn't it a coincidence that it actually ended up being on the day that something actually went wrong? The thing is, everywhere you look when you read about this case, the timeline is that Megan went missing when she was about to catch the bus home. And it doesn't mention Philip T anywhere, but he says they were meant to meet up and she just wasn't there. And also she was last seen waiting for someone. I, I don't even know if I've worded that in a way that it makes sense, but something just doesn't fully add up for me with that whole thing. And I, 
I can't even put my finger on what exactly it is, but why was Dorothy so panicked at 1 p.m.? And why is that consistency even there? What are people's thoughts on that? Cause I just, I'm a little confused, but moving on. To this day, Dorothy believes that Paul Vincent Phillips had something to do with Megan's disappearance. And to be fair, so do the authorities and so do the media and so do I. Although they do believe he had an accomplice. Now, I just wonder if Philip T and Paul Vincent Phillips knew each other. That would be interesting for sure. But then you might think, well, you know, what's the motive? So I'm gonna put a purely speculative theory out there. This is not based on any evidence, but I do think it's important to kind of brainstorm ideas like this. And these things can have a domino effect. So it could be something like that, but I am just saying no evidence to support this, at least from what I've seen. So let's just say Paul and Philip were friends, right? Philip obviously had a massive crush on Megan and he was trying to get her to agree to go on a date for a year, a whole year. And she kept saying no. And Paul, as this slightly older 24 year old guy, had had some experience with women, although we know some of it was not consensual. Let's say Paul's thinking, oh, don't worry, buddy, I got you, we can sort this out. I'm gonna show you how to get with her. And then the two of them linked up that way. So maybe they abducted her together. Maybe one or both of them sexually assaulted her, and then they had to kill her because they would have gone to jail for her rape anyway. Again, no evidence for this. I just wonder if they've considered this accomplice of Paul's to be Philip T, the other suspect. Like they might not even know each other. They might have never met each other before, but it's just something to think about. And if you've got any thoughts to add to that, leave them in the comments below. So then in 2018, there was an article about Megan in a magazine called Australian Women's Weekly. And a person had left a copy of this magazine at Claire Holland House, which is a lakeside hospice run by Calvary Hospital or Calvary Hospital. And what's strange about this copy is someone, don't know who, underlined a number of words in the magazine and scribbled a note on the page of Megan's article and they wrote the name Inge, Inge, quit? I, I actually don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. But they put this name under the photo of Megan Mulqueeny and police were looking for the person that wrote this note in case they had some kind of knowledge and it was like some kind of clue. Police have spoken to Mrs. Quit and she is actually a well-known seamstress in Canberra. And yeah, police basically asked her, like, did she write her own name down? That was a no. And also asked her, you know, questions about having an involvement in Megan's disappearance. It didn't really look like she had any involvement, but the police are still looking for the person that actually wrote the name. And I don't personally know, <laughs> is there really anything to that? It could have just been a person recommending a seamstress and writing down the name to show a friend or something like it really might not be that deep however it is important to let you know these things just in case anything does come of that okay so let's do a bit of a round up here obviously the two main theories in this case are number one philip t who was a schoolboy who had an intense crush on megan and number two paul vincent phillips serial rapist. But there is also another theory that kind of emerged over the years and this is that Megan had this secret boyfriend that she decided to run away with and that she herself did not want to be found and her family very much reject this theory. They think it's absolutely no way but what I will say is sometimes you just don't know. Like stranger things have happened but then a counter argument to that is I do find it hard that Megan would have done this and not shown up anywhere in 36 years and not wanted to make contact with any family, any friends. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense really. But that brings me to the end of this case. See, the thing about this case that really hooks me in is the fact that even though it's a 36 year old case, the most recent update was two years ago and that was a very promising update as well. And it's pretty telling that all this new information came out just after Paul Vincent Phillips died. It just seems to be quite an interesting way it all happened. And it also tells us that they might be really close to finding out what actually happened to Megan Mulqueeny. So with that in mind, anyone who's watching this video who 
might have been in the Canberra area at that time. I know it was a long time ago, but still, and or has any information to potentially progress this case, even if it seems insignificant. I'm gonna put the phone numbers on the screen. So please do contact their designated phone number at 0457844917, or you can put that information forward anonymously to Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000. So thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy it, please leave me a like and comment down below what your thoughts are on this case. Also, don't forget to smash the subscribe button and turn on all the notifications so that you never miss an upload. My TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter are all katephilpot underscore YT. So go follow me on there for any case updates. Major case updates I usually put on my Instagram stories. So that's probably the best place. TikTok, I do more true crime content if that's what you're into. Twitter I kind of use as a diary. <laughs> I'm, I have no filter on there, I swear to God. And as always, I am sending so, so much love right now. Obviously the world is in a bit of a, <sighs> and we just all need a bit more love and positivity right now. And I know true crime content is kind of dark, but doesn't mean we can't be kind to each other and just send out all the love and positive vibes. And like, I know it's a little bit cringy, but at the end of the day, we are, all in it together so but that's all from me so thanks again so so much for watching and i'll see you in the next one bye